and greetings. Good evening, everyone. Great to be here. It's my first time in Berlin. So, first few hours. So, feeling very, very excited to a certain degree. But I will contain it. So, variety of ways we can uh, unpack this, but since it's an evening where some of you and I meet for the first time, we may be be a little bit more reserved, at least I'm coming from that place of where I was brought up, so I would not be too familiar, but don't take it as a sign of a certain uh, tightness in the chest, feeling very, very good. And I feel like speaking maybe to the core of why we have gathered with also some potential room for exchanges, because really it will be more interesting to see what you'd like it to be reflected back. And it doesn't even matter if, let's say, most of us, you gathered here, already familiar with the, what this kind of evening should present itself with. I still don't want to take anything for granted. I want to take this as an opportunity to speak to some of the fundamentals. So, that's what I meant on my part, being reserved. Instead of just going straight there, I would like to kind of take it easy, see? Like, hi, how are you? Yes, where are you from? Okay. And what do you do for a living? Okay. It is by now, should be already very clear to all that all this is all there is, that this what taking place right now is all there is. If it's not clear, means we're still somehow, somewhere in the so-called avoidance game. Avoidance, right? We're looking for pretext, pretexts, circumstantial arrangements to beat about the bush, as the Brits say. In other words, to circumambulate. That's what avoidance is. But avoidance even worse than circumambulation, because circumambulation has an element of worship a preparation to enter the heart of it all. So, in a way, it's done with due of that kind of fervor, ardor, tremor. So as to when one is, as it were, at the point of entrance, there is nothing left that one holds on to, hangs on to. But avoidance is simply finding variety of circumstantial excuses not to look at the core of the question. So therefore, any gathering like this is always an opportunity to speak to something which is foundational to the very why 
of all kinds. And then, of course, we can see how this, what we call life, will still reclaim us back into that where avoidance is simply part and parcel of being alive and going about one's daily jobs, affairs. But when we gather like this, there is an opportunity. So whether we take that opportunity or we miss that opportunity, that's what makes the day. Therefore, I will speak about the fundamentals of Tantra today, so as to put certain things into perspective, so as to also perhaps refresh our understanding of that, what uh, by some modest estimations has been on um, everyone's lips for the past at least 10 years. And that is a revival of what was on everyone's lips some 35, 40 years before that. So Tantra enjoys a great revival, great, great popularity. So in other words, it almost needs no introduction. And yet I would like to speak about the foundational grounds of what Tantra is, not from the scholarly point of view, although that would also be mentioned. <clears throat> I would like to speak about it in terms of what it really is. Because with the popularity of Tantra, what I have noticed, there is this something on the rise which effectively there and then undermines the very premise of that what Tantra stands for. It undermines the very premise of that what it represents. Because it seems as an additional something to throw on into our life. So Tantra is not anything we can add into our life to improve it. This would be an erroneous understanding. In fact, it's contrary to that. Tantra is the end of the world as we know it. That's what really Tantra here represents at the very core of it. Not as Tantra means is a set of tools and methodologies. Yes, of course. Even Wikipedia page, any other page will open up, will quickly give us several references, points of references, variety of translations, variety of interpretations, ta and tra, and all these variations. But at the core, Tantra is where there is nowhere to go. Tantra is something which basically, not just pulling the carpet beneath one's feet, which is already in itself an audacious enterprise. If you come across methodology which can actually pull the carpet beneath your feet, one can, can consider oneself to be fortunate. But Tantra, it's pulling the floor it's pulling the whole ground beneath one's feet. So this is where I would like to open up. So as to clarify something from get going. All spiritual methodologies rise with the sole purpose of a certain rekindling of that what is already there, beyond any doubt. And that what is already there, beyond any doubt, although that is there at all times, simply because that's all there is, unless reconfirmed, not just for each generation, that's way too wide the gap, it has to be reaffirmed and reconfirmed almost on an ongoing basis. More about that later, and feel free to piggyback on that if you'd like to know why that is. But what I'm trying to impress you with is that if one is truly to understand what Tantra is and why I'm speaking about it as the end of one's world or your world, if you don't mind me to put it this way, 
then it is because from the point of view of Tantra, there is no way to go. From the point of view of Tantra, the first step equals to the last. From the point of view of Tantra, there is nothing to achieve and there is no purpose. In other words, it's actually, this is where Tantra, interestingly enough, overlaps with a lot of the non-duality conversation that has been going on since mid-90s, approximately. It started earlier, but by mid-90s, it started to make the waves. Some of you are even too young to remember that. But there are a few. I can, hear, I can see some gray hair in the room, which is good, always reassuring. But I'm in the right company here. There's some, you know, it's always kind of good to know you're not the oldest guy in the room. That conversation has been going for a while. However, with the re-emergence of Tantra, not to be confused with how it is spoken in non-dual circles. This is very important. Again, if you'd like to have clarification about that, I'm all too happy to oblige. So what is it we're speaking about here? Why Tantra also has always been fascinating, particularly for the creative, audacious, renegade-like, rebel-like nature, maverick-like, pirate-like nature, or character, because of the inherent danger in the very premise of what Tantra here actually stands as a methodology. Because it doesn't have from here to here. In other words, it doesn't have this understanding that, okay, it will take time for the rose to fully bloom. It's not like a lot of spiritual traditions where you know that there is something to work towards. Even though you can immediately hold me, those of you who are more familiar with the topic than, let's say, an average folk. Oh, didn't you say that in another video that there are different, let's say, you know, this, this and that. Yes, we can speak about that from the point of view of, let's say, Trika Shaiva philosophies and doctrines. There are three principal schools and there are one of them which is known to be a gradual one. But the very premise of Tantra does not recognize movement from A to B, let alone to Z. There is no movement from A to B. There is no such thing as I'm embarking and here is the goal, here is the goal, here is the goal. Here is the goal, you know, there's no way to go. And this got to be understood from get going, because if it's not understood from get going, then one already on a shaky ground, but not in a nice way, because there's a lot of shaking as well when it comes to Tantra. Because there's no ground, so shaky ground would not cut it. So this is what makes it unique because it does not have that aspect where one is in preparation towards something. In and from the point of view of this understanding, everything is all there is and all there is is that. And even if it's not immediately lived reality, if it's not my reality, it makes no difference whatsoever because that's what it is. So in other words, one is asked to make a quantum leap before one can make a single move. That's why scripturally speaking, it's spoken of in terms of last step in Tantra equals to the first or first equals to the last because it's the understanding that comes with the first step that there is no journey, there is no progression, nothing can be improved. And that's where Tantra becomes interesting. Because once that stand is taken, what it then does, it throws the world 
that we try to transcend, that we try to see through, that we try to somehow understand, we try to somehow avoid, escape, or bypass, because at times it becomes the only strategy, is being seen in a very different light. Instead, the world is all there is. And the world equals to one's tactile experience, because there's no world without experiencing that world in terms of its tactile nature of experience. That's what Tantra is. It's the tactile nature of that experience. It throws a lot of centuries, millennia of understanding, of peeling the layers, and recognizes that actually that what the senses provide here is where every single breakthrough. And if it is not, then it's not to be found elsewhere. So that's why it is fascinating. And that's why it is also formidable, but at the very same time spoken of as dangerous. Because there's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing one can hold on to when one truly understands what Tantra here represents as a spiritual seeing of reality, as simply seeing things for what they are. These analogies have been made already by my predecessors, by classic figures of the past. You can look into this fascinating account, how it was compared by likes of, let's say, Swami Lakshmanju or Swami Muktananda or Chogyam Trungpa, who, by the way, made a tremendous contribution to cutting through all these layers, cultural above all else, layers, because he himself was that in terms of his life, that sword of discrimination, where he comes from, even him renouncing and denouncing his own lamahood, monkhood, so as to plunge fully into the domain of the world, Western world for that, so as to be able to guide people within their own given culture so that he doesn't come there as a foreigner. He had to leave it first, fully being immersed into that. And his contribution is extraordinary because he also had a great penchant for beauty, aesthetics. So therefore he made great companionship with then, by now, canonical figures who brought Zen, at least to the American soil. Zen Buddhism, which stands far apart from what we're talking about now. Because when you sit like that in a black robe and you eat from a black bowl and when you do this and everyone tells you what to do, there's no room left for anything. And yet it has from a point A to point B. In Tantra, none of that. In Tantra, the first understanding here, there is nothing to hold on to. So what is left is this moment, how it unfolds. Are you ready? Are you experiencing it fully? Are you living it fully? That's what Tantra is. is to live to the fullness of your capacity, consciously. Not avoiding, escaping, transcending, and trying to find another reality as this lost Shangri-La or whatever transcendent realm, but here, right now, whatever life throws at you or you are thrown amidst of it. Wherever you find yourself, that's where Tantra is. Yes, of course we can talk about all this, right? It's, yeah, where is this? Give me the papers. Where is it all? We're going to go. Yes, Yantra, Mantra, we can go through all this. But I said it already in Freiburg. Do I need to repeat that? Well, I can repeat that because I went through the same shop just now, today. All the chakras are sold now in the shop. All the colors, all the chakras, all the incense, all the notebooks, block notes, 
Funny enough, guess what? When I looked at the what's available on the shelf, the anahata is gone. Everything is available, even the, you know, uh, you know the third eye in purple color, and, you know, and the sahasrara, the whole stash of muladhara, nobody want to sit in their ass, you know, they want to transcendence. So it's still there. But anahata is not there. I was curious, what color would be for that? I, s I asked the shop assistant, could you tell me what happened to this? Oh, it's very popular, it's gone, sir, don't worry, you know. When are you coming back? I'll have some more. No. No yantra, no mantra today. No. These are, these are spoons and forks and chopsticks. You don't eat them. You eat with them. That's why it's fascinating. Because... When it comes to how to eat, if this analogy to be used, there is no shortage. No shortage. Because Tantra is truly proverbial in terms of the tools. The tools. The variety of tools, you know. It's like... For the painter, the tools mean something. For surgeon, the tools mean something else. You know, for makeup artist, tools mean something else. For the, you know, gangster means something else. You know, it's like, it's like tools. Are they not tools? I've watched that. I don't know, twenty years ago. Sometimes it like it. Ice T was, you know, showing his collection of guns. He talks about the guns. There's a little baby running around, his son somewhere. And he's like showing this, you know, the firearms, deadly weapon. And talks about them as if he's talking about the girlfriend or, or a wife or something. For him, there are tools. Do you, you understand this? That's why Tantra is dangerous, because everything becomes a tool. Everything becomes a tool. Everything has that quality of a real knife. When you work with a blunt knife in the kitchen, you can, you know, you can like, yeah, you know, like, tick, tick, you know, chop, chop, chop. Okay, you missed, all you will end up with a scratch. But if you work with a real, real, real knife, you will not be able to have anything other than that what you do. That's what Tantra is. It's when the experience is so intensely, fully, then everything else, everything else becomes re-submerged, re-submerged into that what is being now experienced at the expense of absolutely everything else. Because otherwise you cannot fully experience this. Otherwise it's skimming the surface. Skimming the surface. So this is why when we speak about the fundamentals, I thought to bring this out into the open so that this kind of gains some, some kind of understanding that what are speaking about here so that there is greater clarity at least in terms of what I am here to share. The difference, let's say, between saying that all there is is this present moment, let's say, and you are already enlightened. Why? Because and then, we, because many things can be written after. Why that is? Why am I already enlightened? An explanation can be given why. Let's say from a non-dual kind of classic, that there is no one ignorant, therefore there is no one enlightened. Why that is? Because from the point of view of utter and entire 
concept of oneness. Everything is just that. And what appears to be temporarily to this or that person, it's a simply on the account of a temporal misperception of reality. And soon as that misperception is removed, then it doesn't have reality of its own. So therefore, why to speak about it as having substance at all? So a lot of Neo-Advaita is based on some of the basic postulates, of course, of the classical Advaita Vedanta. But a lot of that, what classical Advaita Vedanta is known for, of course, is being dismissed, not being brought fully into the picture. So therefore, explanation of everything is already as it is, and there is no such thing from, there is, from, there is nothing, to there is no enlightenment, to there is no you, no me either, all this is just a figment of your and mine imagination, to the attempts to explain how this covers that, to the attempts to explain that here is the separate sense and therefore all the calamity, and the list goes on. But if we suddenly confuse the message of what Tantra here presupposes, then we miss the very, very crucial difference because Tantra does never, does never presuppose that anything that is experienced is somehow unreal, somehow imagination-based, somehow based on an illusion. It takes the stand from get going that all there is is this and it's as real as it gets. And the whole, the whole reality of that is to live it at the fullness of your capacity because that is your capacity. It's not something which belongs to the abstract reality of, let's say, when we speak of the transcendence, Immediately, it's a very abstract reality. Yes, you may have that experience, you may have that experience, you may have that experience of transcendence, you come out of meditation and there was nothing, there was no this, there was no that, there was no personality, there was no individuality, nothing. in fact, there was no space-time even. I didn't know where I was, I didn't know what time it was, I came out, I had to adjust. All I know that I remained alone, which is a great experience, greatly liberating experience, touching that transcendence acutely. But we cannot speak about transcendence as something to believe in. And Tantra takes this approach that the reality of God, or the Self, or the Absolute, the reality of that transcendent is not another reality, neither this, what we call the world, is floating as an imagination or hallucination or an illusion in that reality. But all there is is this reality, because this reality, it's all the God there is. And it's not materialism either. So this is where I would like to begin today's evening. And it's a stunning rose, thank you. Beautiful, in the middle of the winter. So as to open up the line of inquiry. And of course this, in practical terms, this evening is supposed to be as a warm up, as an introduction for what we gathered here. Uh, for what the program itself on Saturday and Sunday. So I should be speaking about the, what I brought to unpack, you know, what kind of fantastic rabbits I'll pull out of the hat, because that's what I'm going to do tomorrow. We're all going to do that. But I don't want to play any kind of um, luring in games here. In fact, I'm so now on the verge of 
no longer going to do this. Because what I can see now is a total misinterpretation of what Tantra is, including that most coveted term, Kashmir Shaivism or Trika Shaivism, because everyone suddenly wants to be in vogue and kind of, yeah, I'm going to be Tantrika now. No, you don't. Trust me. Nobody wants to be Tantrika. No. You don't want to be Tantrika unless, unless that, what Tantrika really means already, already eating you fully, galloping you down. Only when that takes place, you'll become Tantrika. But if you think that you can be Tantrika, that is a misnomer. So, in, you know, it's not like we went through tremendous expense to hire a huge venue and there's hundreds of people and I'm really cutting the branch I'm sitting on, right? No, you already paid for your event, you're here, there's nothing for me to promote more than, but an opportunity here to speak something because it's being filmed. It's being recorded now, you see? So I am doing my job. I even brought a bow tie, but I told me, I, I was told off by my assistants because they said, guess what? In Berlin, everyone walks in pajamas on the street. You're going to look ridiculous. You look like a clown if you go in this neighborhood in Berlin, you know, like all propped up. I'm not making it up. I'll bring that bow tie tomorrow at the workshop. <clears throat> so, thank you for a lovely setting and uh, I would now welcome any of you to take a turn from here if you would like to have now something to address, redress, if you want to pick up from where I've left it, if you want to pick up anywhere what is relevant to you, if you have practical questions, I'm all here for, so please welcome.